Hello, hello. All right. Um, today, we are going to keep going into popular culture. So I guess you could say this is lecture 19.2 on Canvas and in the announcements as we go along. Uh, today, what we're going to do is focus on mainly live entertainment. We'll talk about P.T. Barnum, Dan Rice, um, and the minstrel show. And for the next lecture in popular culture, we'll get into literature, art, and kind of wrap up with popular culture's significance in the 1800s. So what we're focusing on is a time frame in American history, roughly, really significantly, starting in the 1830s and moving on to the current day. Um, popular culture really is really a big thing by the 1830s. Um, so Foster, Stephen Foster, our last lecture, played a big role in that as far as music goes. Um, today, the only key point you're going to have is the minstrel show, but we're going to talk about quite a few things. Um, to begin with, uh, let's start off by talking about the causes, causes for the birth of American leisure culture, or popular culture, all right? Um, becoming urbanized and becoming not only just urbanized, but working and living in a city offered opportunities, many opportunities. Um, in these large cities, you have the building of theaters. Um, the theaters in the long run will be used for movies, for plays, for music, for a little bit of everything in live entertainment. Also, we have days off and holidays and people would take these and utilize them for entertainment. Also, with the shorter work days, you have downtime. In this downtime, reading becomes especially popular, which we'll talk about in the next, in the next lecture. Um, so, with days off, holidays, shorter work days, the creation of affordable theaters, you have this boom with the middle class and the working class going to entertainment. Also, you have a major push for this with the middle class. The middle class spend large amounts of money in popular culture. All right. So, like I said, today we're going to talk about... Um, Leisure culture. Um, <coughs> popular culture, whatever you want to call it, call it, but we're really going to focus on, for the most part, live entertainment. Be when people would go out and see live shows or go to entertainment like a circus or a museum, things like that. Um, the museum, well, the museum that we're going to be talking about is very different from what you think of as a museum, all right? And with that, let's get into and talk about our first dude, all right? Um, his name is P.T. Barnum, all right? See a picture of him right there, all right? Standing next to him on a stool is Tom Thumb, the world's smallest man, according to Barnum. Down at the bottom, you see a picture of what's known as the Fiji mermaid. Um, you have Siamese twins, and of course, uh, can't really get a good, there we go. The lion man, the, so we've got, so you've seen a picture, and you can kind of get an idea of Barnum, all right. Um, Barnum, P. 
P.T. Barnum would get his start in grocery stores. He sold all kinds of things, and he ended up getting into doing lotteries, um, then got into newspapers. Uh, he was always looking for a fresh con, always looking for any way to make money. All right, And one of the first ways this would happen is with a lady named Joyce Heth. Joyce Heth was said to be a 161-year-old lady that was the slave nurse of George Washington. All right. Um, Barnum would purchase the rights to show her and would go around the Northeast presenting her to the public and getting paid for it. Um, Joyce Heth was a tiny, frail old woman. Um, one of her arms and both of her legs were paralyzed. Um, she was emaciated. She only weighed about 50 pounds. Uh, she had no teeth. She was blind. And she had this one little bit of, one little tuft of hair on the top of her head that was bright white. She looked ancient, and that's why he was able to sell it. And he would take her around everywhere, and she would tell stories about taking care of and, and being around as George Washington was growing up. And she would also sing Baptist songs, hymns. So she was a popular act for him and made him lots and lots of money. Uh, he would become fairly wealthy off of taking her around and doing these exhibits, so to speak. Um, this would work very well for him for a long time uh, until she died. Um, when she died, a doctor bought the rights to publicly do an autopsy on her. And Barnum charged about a thousand people to come and watch this doctor as he did an autopsy. Um, the doctor said that Joyce was nowhere near, not even 100 years old. She was more like 60. But Barnum didn't take this line down. He went out to a, well, after the doctor said this, this would go into the New York Post as Joyce, Joyce Heth, a con, Barnum peddled this younger woman telling that she was 161 and really kind of brought him out to the public. Um, what Barnum would do is he'd go to a rival newspaper and have them say that, oh, Joyce Heth is not even dead. She's still on tour with Barnum. Um, the lady that was autopsied was an, another old African-American ex-slave lady. And Barnum would take her out and keep going with this idea of Heth. Um, however, he would start branching out, not just um, after Joyce died. He would get more and more in different groups. Um, and it'd be really what a lot of people during the 20th century referred to as a freak show. Like I, said, like I said, you saw the Lion Man picture. Uh, you saw the Fiji mermaid. Um, there was the Siamese twins. There was a fat lady. There was a strong man. And Tom Thumb. Tom Thumb would be his one of his biggest successes. Um, so Barnum and his American show, as he put it, would go on tour around the U.S., and actually to Europe and become very popular. Um, Tom Thumb, the world's smallest man, which you saw the picture, but I'll show you again. Right there. Tom Thumb was actually a relative of P.T.'s. And his mom and dad loaned him out to Barnum. And Barnum taught him to do impressions and um, he 
always pushed that Tom Thumb was an adult male, but he was actually, when he started working with Barnum, only four. Um, but he would work with Barnum for a long, long time, and he would never get any bigger than that. Um, he was a very tiny and would stay small individual. Uh, but um, to kind of sell him as older, Barnum would let him smoke cigars and drink wine, so everybody would think that he was an adult male. And this was always pushed. So at the ripe old age of four years old, he was drinking and smoking and carousing with the rest of Barnum's people. All right. Um, Barnum would then go on to open up the American Museum. All right. The American Museum would have a little bit of everything. Tom Thumb would have his own exhibit where he'd have a whole little miniature house laid out for him. All right. Um, you would have the Siamese twins, in, and they would entertain people. You had all of these different individuals that would do these things, but you also had exhibits. Um, you've probably heard of Ripley's Believe It or Not, where they have all of these crazy things in there. And Barnum would do things like that. Like I said, you saw the picture of that Fiji mermaid, which was actually an orangutan sewed onto the body of the salmon and then mummified. It was a big hit in Asia, and Barnum would get the rights to it and have innumerable amounts of Americans show up to his museum to try to prove him as a fake. But it was sold. Everybody looked at it and thought it was amazing to see this mermaid, right? Um, he would have this. I mean, in the American Museum, he would have elephants, lions, tigers, bears, um, all kinds of gazelles and elk. Um, in the basement, he would open up a aquarium where he'd have beluga whales, hippos, and numerous other fish and things and to be on display. Um, Barnum charged everybody and anybody that wanted to come in and made a killing with this. Um, the American Museum would be huge. Um, he would even do wax figures. Um, so he was also one of the ones that really pushed the idea of the wax figures industry, <laughs> so to speak. Um, all the time, he'd have numerous new acts, old acts, and everybody in there. It's constantly changing. But not only was it he always trying to get new things, but he would always constantly rearrange the museum so that people would come back. Um, he wanted to come back as much as possible, so this museum was always being rearranged so that people would pay to come in and see new things um, because he would always be moving it around so every time they would come, they'd be able to find new things that they didn't see before. Um, also, um, he always had these signs up that said, To the Egress, and they would be up all over the museum. And on the front, first floor, um, as you can see right here with the... The Barnum Museum. Right there. This big building. On the first floor, all around it, was just, just innumerable doors on all the sides of the building. And all of these signs to, that said to the egress would lead to these exits. And people would constantly follow these signs thinking that to the egress meant this was some new fabulous like display or something new and interesting that they had to see because there's so many signs about it. And they would follow these signs and it would lead them to all these doors where they'd go out into the public and be out of the building. And then they would have to pay to get back in because to the egress means to the exit. Most people did not know what egress meant. And I'd wager to say a lot of people nowadays don't either. So Barnum, um, Barnum is also the one that is credited with giving us a sucker is born 
every minute. Um, that was Barnum's whole idea. He was constantly trying to trick people, as he put it, humbug people, trick them into believing things that could not be real. And the people loved it. They loved being tricked. Um, they would love going to try to figure his stuff out, trying to prove that he was tricking them. But more than anything, they just enjoyed the show. All right, Barnum would continue on with this, and numerous museums and numerous shows, and numerous things that he would push. Um, finally, in the latter part of the 1800s, after the Civil War, he would go on to start the Barnum and Bailey Circus, right? Barnum and Bailey had two competing circuses at the time. There was really not a market for that many circuses, so they joined, combined all of their things, and hence the Barnum and Bailey Circus, which was famous until the modern era. Um, so we've got <coughs> we've got PT, um, PT Barnum, right? Uh, along with PT, all right. We also have, since we talked about circuses, I want to go ahead and, and do and talk about Dan Rice. Um, Dan Rice would probably be one of the most famous entertainers of all of the 1800s. Um, in the election, in one, one, presidential, one presidential election in the 1870s, he would come in third place as a write-in. He was that popular. Um, Dan Rice was the main person for Dan Rice's greatest show on earth, the most popular by far, most famous ringmaster, animal trainer, and circus, all right? Um, Dan Rice, like I said, was the ringmaster. Um, he would do stand-up, he would do monologues, he would do commentary on politics in the world. Um, he, Like I also said, he was one of the most famous animal trainers. And for, uh, truth be told, I don't know if there are anybody that can do it today, but I know he was the first and only one of the 1800s. And up until that point, the only person that had ever taught a horse to walk a tightrope. All right. He and the horse would become legend in America. Um, Dan Rice, I'm going to give you a picture of him right here. You can see him right there. That's Dan Rice in a photograph. Um, in his circuit, in his circus getup, we have him right here. Does that look like anybody you know? <laughs> um, he was considered an American patriot. Um, as you're looking at his outfit and see he is a clown, but the white hair, the star-spangled top hat and clothing, uh, he very well could have been, and some historians do believe he was, the inspiration for Uncle Sam. All right. So Dan Rice, that was his get up. He was a clown as well. Um, he'd wear this as the the ringmaster. Like I said, he would give commentary, jokes, monologues, work up the crowds, present all the animals, do all kinds of fun things. And Dan Rice's greatest show on earth. Too much white in this one. But it is a circus tent, a massive circus tent. So we have Dan Rice, uh, the humorist, the clown, the ringleader, the famous animal trainer. And well, he actually went to clown college in Europe. Um, so he was an actu actually officially educated in this. So you have 
Dan Rice, his greatest show on earth, and quite possibly the most famous person you've never heard of. All right. Um, like I said, Dan Rice was one of the best known names in America. Um, so we've got Rice, we've got P.T. Barnum, some of the live entertainment. And also, you know, you have musicians providing live music. We have plays, we have symphonies, we have operas, just all kinds of different live entertainment. But the most popular out of all of these live entertainments was the minstrel show. All right. And the minstrel show is your key point for this lecture. All right. The minstrel show is made up of a lot of different types of entertainment. Um, it's known as, well, in the beginning it was called the minstrel show. It was also by the 20th century known as vaudeville. But minstrelsy, the minstrel show, the term itself means traveling entertainers because that's what a minstrel was. He was a traveling musician, um, monologist, actor, traveling entertainer. So the minstrel show was made up of actors, magicians, jugglers, mu you know, musicians as well as magicians, um, animal acts, tightrope acts, trapeze acts, um, anything and everything. In essence, it was the original variety show. People, you know, people could pay a price, go in and sit down and get five to six hours of entertainment. I mean, it was a long show because you have all these acts, right? Um, so with the minstrel shows, they hit their, hit the ground running and really become popular in the 1830s. During the 40s, they become even more popular. And during the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, they are it. They are the most popular form of entertainment in America. So 50s, 60s, and 70s, that the 1850s, 60s, 70s, that time frame is the zenith, is the height of the minstrel shows. Um, but they would continue on all the way until the 20th century. And, like I said, would slowly turn into what's known as vaudeville. Um, once the minstrel shows started settling down in cities and theaters and being stationary, it would switch over to become known as vaudeville. However, during the 1800s, especially during the 50s, well, the 40s, you can really even go into the 30s, but from basically the 30s through the 1890s, the most popular bit, the most popular act of the minstrel show was the black-faced minstrelsy. It would, be some, it would become so big that the black-faced minstrel show would go off on its own and become its own thing. But most minstrel shows would have black-faced minstrels too. So not only did you have music, dance, novelty acts, acting, comedy, magicians, everything else, you had this blackface minstrelsy. What it was, was it was a lot of white men that would paint themselves with either shoe polish, burnt cork, grease paint, to paint their face black and do impressions of how they viewed African-American slaves, all right? Um, there's a lot of ways to take this kind of thing. Um, this is a love and hate kind of relationship. Um, some of these minstrel show owners and creators, people like Dwight D. Emmett of New York City, um, he was Irish, wasn't considered even white himself because it's the 1800s during this time he was an Irish immigrant. He had fallen in love with African-American culture that he had seen and been 
privy to and been able to expose himself to in the South on the plantations. He loved the African-American slave music, the dances, all of these kind of things. So you'd see Dwight D. Emmett, people like him, that would dress up in blackface and kind of give the public his interpretation of slave music, slave songs, slave culture. With him, it was, in his eyes, an act of appreciation and love and exposing this wonderful culture to the American public. But not everybody was like Emmett. Um, most of the minstrels that would become famous, things like Jim Crow, Zip Coon, many other minstrels, white men dressed in black-faced, would ridicule and make fun of in horribly racist ways African-American slave culture. It would be song and dance and comedy sketches. Um, it would These sketches would be funny jokes, but also at the same time ridiculing African-Americans. So you can see with this, this is a love and hate thing. Um, you have those that are like Emmett, that fall in love with African-American culture, uh, slave culture, and expose Americans to it. But you also have the hate part, which would be a huge part in um, just creating massive racism. Um, these minstrel shows would, like I said, push horribly racist ideas about African Americans just to get a laugh from white people. Uh, and you got to remember, during the 1800s, the majority of white Americans had never been around an African American before. So what they were seeing in these shows is what they saw as reality. You know, oh, these extremely racist shows are portraying and giving me the real life of these people. And remember, a lot of the racist ideas that come out of these shows were racist ideas that the planters pushed to convince America that African Americans were beasts of burdens, not human beings. So the minstrel show, the blackface minstrelsy, is a crazy, crazy thing where you have people like Emmett that want to expose Americans to African American culture and then you have the other side of it where these racists are using it to ridicule the African American and make a buck. And a lot of the ideas would continue to be pushed and still are believed and pushed by white supremacists in America. Um... So, with this minstrelsy, it's all over the place. And with it, you've got all kinds of music. Um, I want to play two of the most famous minstrel songs. One is called Jim Crow, or Jump Jim Crow. And it's I'll play you a bit of this one. Jim Crow, sung by sheet music singer. So, you can kind of get a, a feel. Um, Jim Crow, um, this character that would become part of the American idea 
that song is one of the most famous minstrel songs, and this is the character, a drawing of the character that was Jim Crow. Um, Jim Crow would become such a famous character um, in American history in the 1800s. When we leave Reconstruction and move into the time of segregation and massive oppression of the African American people in America, that's known as the Jim Crow era. All right, um, but along with Jim Crow, you have Dwight D. Emmett. Um, Emmett would give us quite possibly one of the most famous songs um, in America. Um, all right, so let you hear this one next. <laughs> What? This spot stinks. They you have too. it easy. Let's. All right, here we go. This is, like I said, a song by, well, D.D. Emmett. Um, he was the famous minstrel show, blackface minstrel show owner in New York City. Um, he was the one I've been talking about. The Emmett was the one that fell in love with African-American culture. And this is his song. This would be the opening song in his minstrel show. You probably recognize it. I wish I was in the land of cotton, no time there and not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away. probably heard Dixieland before um, this was a minstrel show you know a minstrel show song that had become very popular and was hugely popular across America in the 1800s um, this was up there with O oh Susanna beautiful dreamer this is one of the major songs of the 1800s popularity wise um, oddly enough Nowadays, it's thought of as the Confederate anthem or a Southern anthem. Uh, in the 1800s, it wasn't. Um, not until the Daughters of the Confederacy and Confederate veterans of America started taking it, rewrote it, and started performing it as an anthem of the Old South. So this would be taken by the Confederacy after the war in their Lost Cause campaign. All right, but before that, this was uh, just a American song. It's kind of like Foster's Old Folks at Home, um, My Old Kentucky Home, this idea of Americans being nostalgic about the farm, right? Um, so we have Dixieland, we have the minstrel show, right? And we have this crazy relationship in America with African American culture. Um, these minstrel shows, as they went on in the 1800s, would actually finally give us some of the very first African American musicians um, and singers. Uh, you may not have heard of him, but he's very important. He's one of the first African American entertainers that's out nationally that everybody falls in love with. His name was Burt Williams. Uh, Burt Williams in the 1890s would create all kinds of dance fads and music with one of his partners and it would be like wildfire in the 1890s. And he, in the 1890s he would dress up in blackface. That's the only way an African American performer could do it. Dress up in the traditionally racist attire of America in the 1800s. 
But by the early 1900s, he would shed the black face in the old ways and become a, a famous, famous singer in the aughts and teens of the 20th century. But you do have this coexistence of this weird, harsh, racist, ridiculing comedy that would shape and play a big role in shaping mainstream America's racism towards African Americans. But also you have this, um, with people like Emmett, pushing these ideas of, and kind of exposing people to slave music and culture and it, not trying to be racist about it. And many of those people, especially the stuff that Emmett and the ones that loved African-American culture at the time, they would be used as a form of protest songs in the cities back in the 1800s. They would be seen as a alternate to white American culture, capitalist culture, and they would, they would be used as the like, common man's protest against the rich and powerful. So with the minstrel show, the blackface minstrel show, especially, it's a very troubling, troubling form of American entertainment. But it's huge. Like I said, it would start up in the 30s, be one of the most popular forms of entertainment, and hit its height in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and would continue on into the 20th century. All right. Um, people were still doing blackface acts all the way into the 1920s. Um, and they were regularly, all the time, everywhere. So we have The Minstrel Show. We have P.T. Barnum. We have Dan Rice. And we have, you know, operas, symphonies. We have the American Museum or the, and the Freak Show and the original kind of Ripley's Believe It or Not kind of museums with Barnum as well. Um, along with that, I want to do one more, and that's where we'll wrap up today. The last person I want to talk about is moving us out of live entertainment and to print. Um, we're going to start next time with literature. But today, what we're going to wrap up with is cartoons. Um, also during this time, in the 1800s, we have America's first cartoonist. All right? His name was Thomas Nast. Thomas Nast would be the man that would create the political cartoon. Um, he would do all kinds of the political cartoons his entire career. Um, there's a huge, beautifully done by the Smithsonian two-volume set of all of his political cartoon work. Um, he is the one that gave the Democrats the donkey and the Republicans the elephant, right? Um, where he was, he used those figures as a thing of mocking both parties because that's what political cartoons do, right? They make fun of the parties. So those two things that have been adopted and taken on as kind of like mascots for both the Democrats and Republicans were created by Nast as forms of satire. Um, Nast, you can see with some of his work, here's one of the ones that he put out when the Emancipation Proclamation came. You can see it right there. Okay. And another one I want to show you, and this is what we'll wrap up on, is this one. Do you recognize that man? 
probably do. That looks like Santa Claus, right? Yeah. Thomas Nast is the one that gives us the modern version of Santa Claus. The big fat belly, the red suit, black boots, the hat, the white hair, and the big beard. <coughs> All of that. The modern idea of Santa Claus comes from Nast. Um, he illustrated a book. Um, you probably heard of it. <laughs> the book was by another man, but the book was "Twas the Night Before Christmas," right? And he would illustrate it, and this is where we would get the modern version of Santa Claus. So we have some live entertainment. We have the beginning of big popular entertainment in print for the time. With that, I'll let you guys go today. Um, good luck. Good night. See you next time.